right, welcome everybody to the session, multi-segment production, future-proofing business in a maturing beverage industry. A uh, big, broad topic, so we have a, a nice set of special guests on the panel with us. Uh, as a little bit of upfront, we all know and love our modern consumers. They're wanting more choices and more places, the right occasions, and producing new segments to reach more consumers and leveraging data and technology to make that happen is the way of the modern beverage producer. The folks on this panel are well aware of that. Uh, we've got three incredible panelists. And before I introduce them, myself, etc., a couple of housekeeping things. First up, there is a comment section. So if you're listening to this or watching this live, go ahead and uh, insert any questions you have for our panelists throughout the session. I'll do my best to either bring them live in the moment if it's relevant or save some time at the end to ask any of outstanding questions. Uh, I also want to thank Craft Beer Professionals for this opportunity, getting us all together for the virtual event. If you can make it to an in-person one, definitely do it. It's not your normal style of conference. It's more interactive and engaging. Really, really, really awesome. And we were so convinced to having attended one that we had to jump in and uh, host a session for this virtual conference. So big kudos to everything CBP does. Definitely go to an in-person one if you can. To introduce myself, my name is Garth Beyer, and I'm the marketing manager at Encompass Technologies. We provide maker-to-market solutions for the modern beverage industry. Specifically, I get to help breweries thrive with the use of our brewery management software. I'm stoked to be joined by Sam Green. He's a head brewer at Untitled Art and innovation brewer at Octopi, one of the largest co-packers in the nation. Next up, we have the one and only Jamie McLean, supply chain manager at Sleeping Giant Brewing Company. He's spent 15 plus years, I'm sure it's going on closer to 20 now in the industry and started like many of us had in the brewing industry at left hand. And there's no shortage of products shipping uh, Sleeping Giant brews, beer and beyond. So it'd be nice to hear his thoughts on uh, multi-segment production. And lastly, to round out this uh, healthy panel, we've got Mike Denton, controller at Coronado Brewing. He oversees the financial impact of expanding cider production, partnership with lifestyle brands, and you know all the things that a controller has to do for a brewery. So we wanted to bring together just different perspectives, different mindsets into the world of multi-segment production. Uh, given the competitive climate of the beer industry, it's no surprise that more breweries are exploring these additional options or focused on ramping them up, maybe taking some tank space away from beer and putting it to something else. But that's for us to discuss. So we're gonna hear from the panelists just a a brief overview of all the products that the brewery produces before we get into the weeds of the impacts of doing so. So Mike, if you want to go first and then Jamie and then Sam, just start off your brewery name again for all to hear and then what products you produce today. And if there's something that you want to hint at that you'll produce, you know, down the road or you're thinking about, go ahead and give a shout out to that too. But I'll go and throw it over to you, Mike, to start it. Sure. Thanks, Garth. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here representing Coronado Brewing Company, a still private, independent, family-owned, uh, about 50,000 barrel brewery in San Diego. We have a couple of restaurant locations. Um, we've been brewing since 96, um, really killing the market right now, looking at uh, Nielsen reports. Um, we're one of the top growing uh, breweries in California. Um, our flagship brand is uh, Weekend Vibes. Um, one of the top selling six packs um, out there on the market. And we also have lifestyle brand uh, Salty Crew, which has also overtaken the San Diego market here with our blonde ale. Uh, we also are growing our cider business and um, uh, looking to see what's in store for us next over the next few years. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Jamie, how about you? <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Jamie McLean, Sleeping Giant Brewing Company. Um, we're located in Denver, Colorado. We are a dedicated contract brewery, so we do not have any of our own brands. Um, we've been around about eight years. I've been here for four of them. Um, we primarily try and focus on beer. That's what everyone who works here likes to make, but uh, we have branched off to you know, CBD products, uh, we package water, um, uh, we're doing energy soda, uh, kombucha, and of course, most recently getting into RTDs and all that that entails. Um, basically staying away from wine and ciders and um, trying to focus more on 
beer, but as we know, that is changing. Um, yeah, so that's us. Very cool. Over to you, Sam. Uh, my name's Sam Green. I'm with Untitled Art. Uh, I'm also with Octopi Brewing Company, so I get kind of the best of both worlds. We have uh, in-house brewery, which is Untitled Art, and then a co-packer, which is Octopi. Uh, I think we've been a brewery, Octopi's been a brewery for eight years, Untitled Art for seven now. Um, we make all sorts of beverages, pretty much almost any liquid. So beer was the main focus. Uh, we make non-alcoholic beer, uh, CBD water, THC water, seltzers, uh, RTDs, adaptogens, um, a couple other things. So we've dabbled in a, a lot of different liquid beverages. So it's been fun. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Sam. All right, we'll go around the panel just once more. If you could share kind of what got you into producing multiple segmented pr products, like Jamie, you know, your background with the contract brewing, it's almost out of necessity, but would love to hear from your own voices. What got you into this? What drove the decision to go beyond beer for your breweries? Jamie, if you want to maybe start, and then Mike and Sam. Sure, um, I'll start. It, uh... I mean, definitely out of necessity. Um, when I started here, we had um, production scheduled for months and we uh, definitely had the heck of what we wanted to do. We would focus more on beer. Uh, most of our partners were beer, a um, little bit in seltzer, but it, as, as things go, as things move on in the contract world, um, we don't fall back on our own brands because we don't have any. Um, someone might leave, someone might come, but generally there's always somebody bringing in a new brand as an existing partner, or um, if they leave entirely, we just move someone up in the pipeline and onboard, onboard them. Um, over the past few years, uh, that has, like, while we can definitely bring in new partners. Um, the beer mix has been getting less and less. So when we have some breweries to choose from to bring in um, and what their timing is like, it, it becomes a little more uh, advantageous to, okay, we're going to, we're going to try this other partner that is not traditional beer. And for the most part, our brewery is set up to blend and do many of the drinks that um, we've been able to do with, you know, beer is beer and sodas and water and all this we can do in the equipment that we have. Uh, the big question most of the time is um, the legality of it. And um, are we able to do something else? Um, we did a big push recently for NA products. We work with a local company and, uh, We've got quite a setup inside our building that is NA, and that took some infrastructure. But um, it's mainly uh, what is out there, and we don't want to over overcommit and over like run our production team twenty four seven. Yeah, I've talked enough about it, so I'll, I'll pass it on. Awesome, go for it, Mike. So clearly doubling down into the the core brands on the beer side. But tell us more. What's what's got you guys getting into cider and starting to produce that? Sure. Thanks. Um, gosh, I would say, I mean, overall to remain relevant, right? As your brand to continue um, your 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 marketplace. I would say what's driving it is really uh, the industry business cycle maturity, the saturation of the market. Um, kind of the, the globalism approach of just the expanded marketplace for products and also just an expanded source of competition. Uh, there's various players in the Bev Elk industry that are, are now, um, everybody's kind of branching out in this way from different industries, from just the, um, the beverage industry or the cannabis side, the non-elk. Um, everybody's trying to, to out compete each other on, on the chessboard. Um, I would say what's driving is just the, the beer commodity, commoditization versus trying to develop differentiators as uh, craft beer made its wave um, over the last decade or so. 
Um, currently, it's, it was down a couple percent. Now it's about zero percent growth in the industry on the craft beer side. So uh, you could only make so many IPAs, only so many hazies. Um, seltzer has run its course. Um, you know, what's next? What does the consumer want? How do you differentiate yourself in the marketplace? Um, and it's really what I found just the last year in the uh, bevelk industry. It's it's like the fashion industry. Like it's really how do you look? How do you uh, you know? How does these products make consumers feel? How does it differentiate? Like if they could drink one thing, where do they go to? There's only so much um, liquid people can consume. So I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Sam, from the from the get go, started beer and and so quickly beyond. I think you had probably a laundry list of options, just like Jamie did, that you guys produce. So share a little bit more about what got you into all the different products. Yeah, we kind of similar to echo what both of these guys said is. Um, you know, being a contract facility, primarily, we just listen to what the market is saying, and we had less breweries approaching us and more non-beer alternative beverage companies approaching us. So we kind of turned the bus around and we said, well, wait a minute, we have a brewer's license, but we have all this business that we're turning away for non-beer product. Um, so we went and got a beverage license, and that was right a little bit before COVID. Mm-hmm. And then that that did wonders for us because, I mean... The, during COVID, the beer industry did really, really well. Uh, and then you saw a market correction now. So it's nice to just kind of stabilize and we'll make products that other people are making. You know, seltzers were really, really hot. And personally for Untitled Art, we were like, well, we can make a seltzer that's way more flavorful than these things. Like, I think there's a market here and it still does really well for us too. I mean, the seltzer market is shrinking, but we're doing really well. So there's still cracks in there to kind of I don't want to say exploit, but venture into and say people are still looking for full flavored seltzer beverages or stuff like that. Um, Same can be said with the CBD or the THC. You know, we're just constantly experimenting and we want to push our boundaries, get out of our comfort zone here. And I think with Untitled Art being a leader, we kind of show, hey, this is everything Octopi can make. And then other clients say, oh, well, that's funny because we are looking for someone to make X, Y, Z, a soda, an adaptogen, whatever then they'll approach Octopi. So kind of goes both ways. Yeah, that's awesome. That great segue into the follow-up question that you kind of kind of just answered. We'll, we'll keep it with you. So can you explain that creative process in, in making and launching new beverages and new segments? Is it do you, for everything? Do you use Untitled Art and then, like you said, showcase it to all of your clients and kind of show them what, what you're capable of? Or is it a give and take? How do you go through the creative process? Yeah, it's probably about like a 60-40 uh, on Title Art leading. So with Seltzer especially, we knew we wanted to get into that game. And so that's something we pursued. How can we do this? How can we do it better? Same thing for non-alcoholic beers. You know, I was personally frustrated at what was in the market. And I'm like, there's got to be a way to make a full-flavored micro-brewed beverage that you don't really compromise anything. And so we really wanted to pursue that. That has brought a lot of attention to Octopi and Untitled Art. Uh, but there's other companies here too that we've signed with that I would have never thought of. Oh yeah, like I won't name specifics, but someone will bring in a beverage and I'll be like, I've never even heard of this kind of thing, and we'll pursue it and kind of attempt to master it or just throw our hat in the market and say, well, these are kind of cool. This is what some people in Asia are drinking, so we want to try to replicate that and see if it see if it resonates with that crowd or not. And sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So. Yeah. So inspiration for you, it's coming from global like you just yeah up to asia like this is so so much larger than hey what do what does north america you know want out of a, of a beverage right now for sure yeah it it, it keeps it fun too because it's not i mean it avoids any tunnel vision so i mean i've been in the industry for a very long time and personally i was really into beer but you start pulling out all these other thought processes of there's a whole world still out there so Cool. What's, uh, could you give an example of maybe the, the craziest uh, either beverage or ingredients that you guys are, are working with, you know, without naming anybody's particular name, but anything that you're just like, wow, this is crazy. We, you know, I just did an event for 450 North or with 450 North um, and we had a pineapple lychee vanilla smoothie seltzer and we were 
one of the only companies to my knowledge that has brokered in an entire boatload of lychee like we were because no one had ever done that before so we needed x amount and when and all you could buy was one boatload so we were talking to other fruit companies saying hey we need a couple drums of these do you guys want to have the other drums and they're like oh yeah we've never done it because it's too expensive so mm -hmm. that's kind of a fun project yeah very cool and how about you jamie on uh your side of things so you've kind of hinted a little bit at the you know you you evaluate the desire for beer and you've got a team that likes to brew beer how do you balance that with the the requests that come in and creating something new is the team stoked by it because they have a little bit of beer brewing you know always available to them to do chat through a little bit of the, the innovation component yeah sure so <clears throat> yes we do we do like beer above all else and that is what we try to gravitate towards <clears throat> when it comes to the creative process and innovating um uh, I'll say it again. We don't have our own brands. We don't have our own uh, outlet to try things. So when someone comes on with a new idea, we generally R&D it with them. Sometimes people have a recipe. They have exactly the way they want to do it. And we just tweak mm -hmm. it with our system. Um, you know, it doesn't, everything's different. Every brew house is different. We utilize a mash press and a, uh, hammer mill. So we have to tweak beer recipes regardless. <clears throat> we do a pretty decent job of hitting it the first time, but <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but for everything else, uh, sometimes it's the first time we've done it. And then we can say to partners who come along, um, oh yeah, we, we're well experienced in seltzers or yes, we've done many, any beers now. Um, this will be our first kombucha. Uh, how do, and we, we generally work with them and figuring it out. So, uh, it's, it's, a the funny thing with contract beer is you think, oh, we've, we've done this so many different times, onboarded a new partner. Now we know how to do this next one. And then they come on and everybody wants something different. And it's just, uh, it's it keeps me engaged and uh, enjoying my job because it's it's not a mundane cookie cutter thing. It's uh, everybody's unique and everybody wants to just a little bit different sourcing it from a different place or a specific way. Some people are here on site for most production. And then we've got some partners who've been to the brewery once like it's mm -hmm. it's a wide array. Um, I'm trying to. <laughs> You have to forgive me. I'm trying. We sign NDAs with everybody. Some people are black box status. Some people are like, I don't care. Uh, so I try to <laughs> be care. Better, better be careful. animal side of course. Um, you know. Anyways, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So I answered that. Yeah, definitely. And Mike, for for the cider side of things, can you share maybe just a, a line of insight into you know where were certain people hired on for this? Was there a lot of trial and error with it or did somebody come in with this idea of like hey this is how we're going to do it and it was kind of you know i don't want to say lacking innovation mm -hmm. at the beginning but it was kind of hey let's lean in use the resources we have how did that unfold mm -hmm. for colorado sure yeah i'll talk cider just as a, spe a specific example for us um we had a product line of cider running of a couple of core brands for basic nice and dry than a super fruit when I joined. Um, um, it's a good example as plans and industry changes over time. Um, originally, strategy was having organic cider and going the organic route. Mm -hmm. And as supply chain changed and that, you know, the price went up tenfold, you know, change strategy and product offerings. Um, basically, we had our uh, cider production and our, our main uh, brewery facility. And now that that proof of concepts come to market and we've expanded, we have it um, in uh, distribution. We've just um, been looking to see like, where's our market niche for that, for product line, what's going on in the industry, what different flavors or styles are being offered. Uh, we've invested in some more equipment. So instead of, manual processes of doing pasteurization 
there's different equipment to maintain uh, the quality. Uh, the quality control was really key um, from production to packaging, right, into uh, the kegs. So um, right now, I mean, we have an innovation team. We're looking at, um, you know, making a 2024 year plan. Um, we have core product, and then it's just tracking core sales. There's only so much you could focus on at once from a brewery for sales, for your sales team and your distributor. So then it's just staying fresh. Um, let's, I think it's cider month this month. So we have offerings in like the tap room and then uh, plans for another, just kind of continuously expand um, uh, between core beers, core ciders and limited release to mm -hmm. kind of test out the market and different flavor profiles. Awesome. Cool. Uh, you uh, also you set also up a nice segue into the next question is, can you guys share an example of an equipment purchase you had to make to, to get into us? We don't need the full laundry list, but was there anything that was, you know, as you got into a new product or, or Jamie, somebody requested something that you guys had never done before? Is there any equipment watch out for or tidbits of, of, I don't know, advice to give to others that might be looking to, to branch out beyond beer? And Mike, maybe hit you first and then Sam and then Jamie from a equipment and bison um, perspective. Sure, I'll just, I'll just continue on that aspect. Um, you know, coming from the, the finance perspective, right? Um, you know, you guys are in a different position, contract brewing, but um, for us, it's like um, a couple of different strategies. One is, does, does sales solve all problems or not? And the answer really is no, it's to it's too competitive. You have to watch um, more than just your sales, your your top line. You have to watch your your profit margins. So, what is it really costing to make? What did you think it was going to make? What's your true um, labor costs, facility costs, equipment, the depreciation, the cash needs, um, your packaging? All that comes into play um, as you expand your product offerings and going to different brands or, or packaging. For example, like we're expanding into uh, 12 packs and 19 twos. So it's just, just adds to the complexity of scheduling, equipment needs, uh, just really being on top of uh, production planning and um, trying to find efficiency between uh, downtime, changing uh, your, your packaging lineup for different sizes. And, um, really everything costs twice as much as you originally think it's going to be so um and i'm really interested with sam and jamie here like um you know working we've been expanding in-house using our internal expertise our team uh, we did build out our, our leadership team our operations management our head brewery comes from a, a head cidery um the the, the family the management team is into it so it's like what do you want to produce too like we stay authentic to our brand image and what do we want to uh, put out into the marketplace that, that we like as a as an internal brewery ourselves and then um you know how can you use your your expertise to develop that and really to get to a point beyond being a, a small business is being able to work with strategic partners and, and networking with other people, uh, seeing what's working for other uh, companies. And uh, the big thing we're looking into is is uh, contract brewing and co-packing to kind of take it to the next level. Bring it on over. Yeah. <laughs> I'll email you afterwards. <laughs> awesome. Sam, uh, hit us. Hit us with some it's kind of sounds like there's equipment, but people might be the, the bigger investment here. So I'll let you. Yeah. Um, we spent a lot of money on a dealkalizer, a membrane filtration unit, a very expensive piece of equipment uh, and a lot of add ons that go with that. Um, that was going to allow us to make some of the most pure, cleanest, neutral sugar base on the market. Uh, that's paid dividends 10, maybe 100 fold over now. Um, it also doubles as allowing us to dealkalize any beer product we make and then reconstitute it or rehydrate it up to percentage. So 
that machinery was really great. That's one of the avenues that we went through. Most of the equipment that we've been purchasing or seeking, I guess, has been what we call batching. So we divide two things from brewing or batching, which probably sounds like Jamie has a little bit of experience in that too. Um, and all the equipment that goes with that, you know, dry tables or tank holding storage or powder blenders, that kind of stuff. Um, and our labor division, actually, I don't know the full numbers, but just from the sense of it, um, I would say brewing labor probably makes up about 33% of what we do here. And batching labor is now 66. So what once was all brewing, all cellar work, dry hopping, that kind of stuff. Now all the attention is going over to making these batch products and shepherding them, making sure all the ingredients are added, you know, inventory control, stuff like that. Um, it's It's been kind of crazy, kind of fun. We've had multiple very large expansions. Uh, we've been able to keep our feet underneath our ground for a little bit here. Um, and that's because, yeah, we kind of buy, we go very expensive on the equipment. Being a contract facility, we want to offer, we have the best in the market. That's why XYZ should brew, come and brew here, Coronado or someone like that. Um, so that's kind of fun. And uh, yeah. So. Cool. Jamie, how about you? Any learning insights on the equipment side? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we, we've only been around about eight years. And when it comes to new equipment purchases, it's, uh, it's hard to justify buying something without a partner to um, utilize it. So there's, there's some big things that uh, you definitely like to look at. We also have a reverse osmosis style membrane um, dealkalizer. Um, and that that was massive. You know, it's basically another seller. Uh, but I would say, like getting into beyond beer, the things that uh, are really important are, um, you know, pasteurization and a uh, daw, like a deaerated water plant. Um, those things really help you free up tank space and ensure that those products that might not have alcohol are going to handle uh, being packaged. Um, you know, I say all that and we we do spend a lot of money in our lab. We have a, a pretty extensive lab set up so we can run testing and uh, ensure that our our products are out the door and they pass all the QA checks. So aside from like, I just assume if you're a successful brewery right now, you have a good lab and you have a good lab team and a good program. But uh, yeah, the biggest thing I would say is uh, free up some tank space and get a fast DAW plant. Awesome. Great, great advice. Now, high, high level and broad, I'm going to let you guys kind of take this question however each of you wants to take it. How in the heck do you guys manage the operations of all of these different products? Like, how do you do it? How do you manage it all? Mike, do you want to? Oh, no, Sam, I see you taking a breath. Oh, here, oh almost. Uh, yeah, we have. So in addition to us growing physically for the demand of the beer or barrels, um, not necessarily beer, uh, our labor costs for individuals, not even physically creating it, just the management of that whole spectrum has increased, multiplied exponentially. So start to get more clients or newer clients who want different types of beverages. And, you know, some of the people from the background here know beer and know how to talk beer. But then when you get into cider, it gets a little bit grayer or you get into sodas. Now it's a complete unknown area. Um, so we have separate teams for separate divisions. Uh, Untitled Art just is kind of all on its own, which is fine. Um, and we just we had to end up hiring a CBD uh, and THC specialist here because that's a language I don't really speak. I was an amazing hire. His name's Aaron Ducksworth. Um, and it's just been like about finding the right people in the right places just in time and how to extract information from them and glean it on, okay, we know how to do shipping, packaging, all this stuff, but we don't know how to physically create the liquids. So what can you tell us about that? Um, it's been a challenge, but it's also been a fun ride. Awesome. Jamie, how about you? Um, ask me the question again, will you? You've been, uh, you've been cutting out. How is my... How's my connection? 
you're okay on my end. Okay. Yeah, you're you're coming through fine. So how how do you manage the production of all these different products? Um, great question. So we we do not uh, we do not have separate teams when it comes to um, different product lines. Um, we do we do have a brewer's notice, DSP, you know, food safety. So we run it all together in the same 70,000 square foot building. Um, and we generally just do it, uh, you know, using orchestrated beer and with our scheduler and our scheduling team. And one of the things with contract brewing is there's a different tier structure on how materials are supplied. So I prefer to control it all. But that's not always the case. You know, people have hop contracts, people have specialty ingredients, they want truckloads of lychee. I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, it's always a little bit different. If somebody, I try to say, you know, we need this stuff here. We need the, uh, the products and the uh, raw materials here certain time before production. And that doesn't always happen. And it's kind of an on the fly. How do we change our schedule to accommodate that. Um, you know, we build in buffers and we build in preventive maintenance, but uh, inevitably I would say a couple times a month, we are making some kind of rescheduling um, event that uh, really challenges our production. You know, if we have an extra tank here or there, it's, uh, it helps, but you know, it's, it's kind of on the fly and what works you know when you're dealing with this many different products you can't always repitch yeast into something that's not beer and etc so luckily that's not my job mm -hmm. i just try to get the materials here in the right place at the right time the right cost the right quantity um but you know we work together we don't have a huge a huge team either there's about uh 35 of us right now total of course, that's zero marketing, zero sales, zero tasting room. Definitely, very cool. And how about you, Mike? How do you, how does how does the team manage the operations? How do we manage growth and operations? I would say, um, gosh, it's just a, a close knit approach. Um, I would say, um, your 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 people really make. Your, your company overall, I mean, we have an innovation team. We have scheduled periodic meetings to focus on innovation and like an annual uh, schedule of what brands we're focusing on, what new products, when they come to market, kind of a quarterly rollout. Um, I mean, really what I found in other companies and industries, and especially here, it's really integrating the execs with sales production and finance and all three have to be in the same wavelength um it's, you know we need to be able to produce what sales wants to push and then finance is kind of the glue that holds it all together everything kind of rolls in the finance through the erp system and tries to solve all the problems in the back end and get into the reality of you know anywhere from the the purchasing cycle to sales and billing and paying key vendors and hops to labor and equipment, CapEx purchases. Um, really, that's the name of the game every week is just meeting with uh, your team and staying focused. Um, it's always like why we're not growing more. It's always a time and resource con constraint. There's always, only so much you can focus on and uh, you need to have the right uh, team and uh expertise to take take things to the next level very cool awesome all right got a couple more questions here again anybody tuning in live throw some comments or questions in the comment section of the stream uh, i'm gonna give you guys all a crystal ball here and i'd love to hear what your thoughts are on the future think maybe one year out maybe year and a half year out of what the beverage landscape looks like are we are we still holding tight to beers plateaus as it 
Is it hang around? Or are we going to go into something from Asia, Sam, that you're like, oh no, this is this is the next wave here. So what does the, the beverage industry look like for each of you guys in the next year, year and a half here? So Sam, why don't you take it away? Yeah, uh, glad this is recorded so you can look back a year and be like, man, that guy was talking out of his butt. Um, yeah, I'm curious what you have to say too. <laughs> I think, I, you know, I have felt this for a while. I think the beer market is pretty saturated, I think. Um, and we play the game too. So, you know, the amount of IPAs that you can get from anywhere within a 10 mile radius of 12 different new breweries that have a Citra IPA, uh, it's just not really sustainable. Uh, same uh, down at 450 North, you know, and they have a couple hundred different kinds of fruit smoothies. I mean, we, we were just as guilty. We brought those too. Is that really what uh, people are in the market for right now? I guess temporarily next year, a doubtful. Uh, that's why we, personally we've pursued other things. We have invested a lot just mentally, not even financially in this THC beverage. And is that going to replace alcohol consumption? Um, hopefully, maybe at, at least minutely. I mean, I love beer. I'm in the beer industry. That's why I do this, but it's just nice to see other alternatives. Non-alcoholic for sure is gonna be around. You can see everybody, I mean, even the big players are now desperately trying to come out with alternatives, non-alcoholic beer, and how can they satiate their customers for not even just completely being sober, but just in reduced consumption. So personally, like I'll have a six pack of whatever, we'll just say an IPA and I'll take out one and put in an NA because I don't want to consume that much alcohol, but I don't want to forfeit the social experience. So it's kind of nice to be around people and still have something in your hand, but not necessarily alcohol. So I'd say NAs, THCs are going to be really high. I think micro brewed extreme flavors, I don't probably not going to be as strong as it was in the previous years. Awesome. Jamie, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I, uh, I wish I had a crystal ball. Um, uh, ultimately, I, I think as a brewery, you know, it would be good to get ahead of these things and say, oh, yeah, we can do this as your uh, co-packing partner. But it's up to it really is dictated by what what is brought to us and not necessarily us marketing what we can do for other people. Um, if it's, if it's a, a popular thing and you want to, you want it, we will help you bring it to market. Um, otherwise I, I'm not sure I have much input, uh, other, like one year, one year down the road is, is pretty tight, but I mean, Sam's right. People want things so fast these days. And if you can't get it, your thought to market quickly and effectively, then someone else is going to do it. And uh, just how we, we get on our phones and we want information immediately, people get bored so fast. So I think the, uh, what's, what's important is to be able to execute it quickly, not over commit yourself. I can't recall how many times I've, I've been told by sales, oh, I can sell some more, just produce some more. And then, you know, a month goes by and it's all still there um, because that trend has passed. Um, but, you know, look, five, 10 years down the road, we'll probably be talking about psilocybin drinks <laughs> and um, a lot of other, you know, like healthy medical combined beverages. So I'm, I'm not sure. I hope. Yeah. I hope there's some cool stuff though, because I'm always excited to work on new things. Very awesome. And Mike, last but not least. Hmm. Uh, I have an interesting perspective on it. Um, I would say some of it, some of the, the fads will ebb and flow. It's great to have product diversity and different offerings to the consumer. And I'll be interested to see what sticks. Um, you know, when I first moved it, San Diego in 06, it was the big bomber glass bottles and all the different craft breweries at the peak, making just different IPAs, different styles. And now that's come and gone. And now we just have, you know, cans. And um, I would I would bet my money and paycheck on uh, beer. I would I'm going to kind of 
try to defy the conventional uh, kind of speak out there now what's cool and what you should buy. I would place my money on craft beer. It's been around. It's the best. Um, you can you could drink the most of it in a social setting and enjoy different varieties. It's um, it's legit. It's I think consumers will continue to try different things and try different things maybe once or twice and then default back to a, a um, good quality, uh, tasteful product that they prefer and they're familiar with that they um, that represents them. Um, I do think it will be a diverse beer marketplace, not just IPAs and hazy IPAs and double IPAs. Um, I think people will want an alternative and what stands out, um, you know, not everybody just drinks Bud Light or Miller Light, right? But it is a huge portion of the market. Uh, people want easy drinking beer, you know, um, not everybody are beer um, gurus like us that want to sample it for uh, um, the, the almost the science or art behind it. They just want um, a tasty beer that they can enjoy with dinner or being out um, as people uh, go out to hopefully socialize more and more often and get back out there. Um, I think, um, you know, we, we see different beers growing. Yeah, our, our weekend vibes are our solid IPAs growing, but our um, salty crew beer took off because it's 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 not a commitment. You could you could drink it and still um, I, th I think on the, like on the NA side, it's really um, how you could still maintain like like an active lifestyle and not let something that you enjoy kind of hold you down. That's why there's you know the seltzers are easy drinking. The NA is growing. Um, but it won't, won't ever replace kind of the, the true experience. Yeah, that's interesting. It's kind of like, what is the, the beer equivalent of the reason others produce other beverages? So like, here's the reason why seltzer took off. Now, how do you launch a beer brand that does that same thing? It's an interesting uh, perspective, Mike. Thank you for that. We'll, uh, we'll do one more round table on a final question. Uh, obviously, listeners here, are tuning in to get advice. So what advice do each of you have for somebody that's looking to start a new product or launch into a new product? So they might not have the equipment yet or the people or the resources, but they're looking at, into it. What is uh, what's a watch out for or best tip of, or advice for somebody that's looking to produce something beyond beer? Sam, do you wanna go first? Yeah, I would say um, just go for it. Like. Um, you can do your research until the cows come home, but you know, and as kind of Jamie was talking about, it's, it's kind of now or never, if you misstep, someone else is going to do it. So if you have an idea and you're passionate about that idea, I would advise to attempt to turn it into reality. Even if it doesn't play out, you're going to learn a lot from that and you can kind of reconvene and at least say, well, I gave it a shot. The market didn't want it. I was too early. I was late. Uh, and then you kind of learn from that. So awesome. Thanks for not suggesting everybody buy a de alcoholizer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put it on a credit card. Yeah. Awesome. Jamie, what's uh what's your advice for for folks looking to get into something maybe beyond beer? Well, um, that's a good question. If you're looking to do it yourself at your own brewery, then um, you know get uh, get all the information you can uh you, you know um sam said hire people who know what they're doing that is super helpful to just talk to people in the industry who've done this before um i can't count how many times we've gotten so far into something and then i was like oh i should call my friend who uh, actually do, deals with fruit on a regular basis and then i was like oh fuck, why didn't excuse me why didn't i do this in the first place and I just wasted at least a week of time when I knew I just had the answer right there. There's plenty of resources. Um, we we are a contract brewery. We try to bring in people on a regular basis. I We're also all friends here. I don't necessarily want all my local breweries getting into contract brewing and taking business away from us, but 
at the same time, we are all in it together and um, we're pretty confident in our quality and products. So, um, but if you are coming to us to make a beverage product, it's, it might take, might take a little less time than trying to do it yourself. If you have the capacity at your own place, um, then it's probably worth it. You know, we're not the cheapest on the block because we are dedicated. Um, we can't fall back on any of our own brands. Um, granted, that has its own effects with our team who doesn't get to brew anything that they consider their own. We do have a small R&D set up and a pilot program and we do what we can um you know team building events and whatnot but um you know there's there's pros and cons with all of it um i did want to say one thing about what mike said you know beer is going to be around and um all these products we are talking about you know beers had its ups and downs 2008 was difficult 2016 was difficult but you know, this is really short term. Beer has been around for thousands of years. Um, so he's got a point. And uh, yeah, I just want to say yeah. I like your attitude. <laughs> awesome. Great. Mike, uh, take us home. Last piece of advice to, to all the listeners and watchers. Um, I guess I would say really think about it and think, why would somebody buy your unique product, right? How do you differentiate yourself? Are you big producer that's just taking over uh like uh, horizontal expansion does everybody want to buy you know dunkin donuts or monster alcohol or do you want um a different like true uh, brewery like who do you want to support i would say um you know and i was trying to take my own advice uh you know we're looking into other product offerings and it's like we need to make something that's authentic and represents our brand and style and complements our current product catalog and uh, kind, of, kind of stay true to it and just something that uh, expands on what you are currently offering or something that your management, your team is truly interested in making, um, not just, it doesn't have to be fully just uh, commercializing everything to do what your competition is doing because everybody else is doing it. Um, but at the same time, um, you, need to, you need to stay relevant, stay modern, uh, and give uh, consumers different liquid to try. Reason to come to your tasting room, um, have different experiences, and then it's up to the individual consumer to choose, you know, ebb and flow, uh, what variety and volume of consumption that they choose awesome great so leave it that awesome beautiful any final words from uh any one of you otherwise we could round this out with a big applause to craft beer professionals and each of you mike with coronado sam on and octopi jamie sleeping giants uh massively appreciate you guys tuning in here to have a good healthy discussion on multi-segment production thanks for having us Garth. All yeah, right. indeed. It's been fun. And it's a pleasure meeting you guys as well. Yeah, likewise. Awesome. Cheers, guys. Thanks again. Right. Cheers. Cheers.